chapter thirty one of lady jim of curzon street this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lady jim of curzon street by fergus hume chapter thirty one leah made no farther attempt to decivilize jim he was too engrossed in egyptian flesh-pots to set out for the promised land of splendid adventure and elizabethan enterprise in his clay there did lurk a spark of that promethean fire which melting meaner aims into one passionate purpose to explore the world and exploit the world has made england great unfortunately it could not be fanned into anything resembling a flame the cucumbers the melons the leeks and the garlic of civilization appealed to him insistently and even if he did betake himself to roaming unfenced wastes he certainly would not number a wife amongst his luggage moreover and this she knew by instinct his basic qualities were markedly those of the homing kind this being so a few months of tent and road would be used by him as a relish to increased appreciation of the cedar chambers and painted halls wherein his cradle had been rocked it was clearly impossible to make a silken purse out of this particular sow's ear so jim drowsed very contentedly beside the fire while his wife out of sheer ennui chased piccadilly butterflies or sat in her ducal niche to be bored with social adoration but one thing rendered life endurable to leah pentland at this juncture and that was her coming opportunity to exhaust the enjoyable now that the days of compulsory sorrow were ended she had plenty to do and ample funds for the doing at firmingham the new king and queen celebrated christmas new style with celebrants who were but doubtfully informed as to the why and wherefore of the festival certainly jim and his comus rout invaded church on the holy day and yawned impatiently through liturgy and sermon but this was a concession to county prejudices leah would tolerate no santa claus tree no druidical decorations and no modernized mumming of the middle ages these out-of-date enjoyments were replaced by political and poetical tableaux by amateur renderings of smart french and dismal russian plays and by the kitchen lancers when riotous cakewalks palled imported musicians in an incorrect foreign uniform played grieg's melodies tchaikovsky's weird sound poems and that nerve-exhausting music of the present by herr wagner which has now arrived at its future for the uncouth carol of innocent victorian days was substituted Sousa's clanging marches comic songs clean but inane and catchy airs from the newest vaudeville miscalled musical comedy out-of-door sports included skating on artificial ice since it was a green christmas motor-car races attempts at golf and polo playing riding driving and sauntering flirtations while bridge circulated the guests money at odd moments it was truly wonderful to see how completely these nominal christians had substituted a heathen festival of some sort for the orthodox pleasures of tradition the participants in the orgy were all smart and all blase perfectly dressed and triumphantly selfish with that careful avoidance of spoken appreciation which marks the modern trifler they took leave of the duchess with the remark that her notion of what yuletide should be was not half bad a week of dull sunday so to speak had been got through capitally nothing frumpish about the thing pronounced mrs penworthy who had been asked to gratify jim and who had been found woefully wanting in snap every one was quite up to scratch leah pentland did simply ripping off her own 
the little woman was not talking an unknown language for the latest successor to algy understood her excellently well she spoke the gibberish of those in a hurry which she had taken some pains to acquire the very few words in the dictionary used by the fashionable were dropped into the melting-pot and came out in ungrammatical lumps of misused adjectives and verbs with a paucity of pronouns and prepositions mrs penworthy whose sense of humour was strong had proposed that lionel should translate the bible into this time-saving vernacular so that its spiritual meaning could be arrived at by those who thought the verse of milton and the prose of bacon starchy wouldn't hear of it said she to algy's latest successor while munching american sweets in the up-going train told him it would be spiffing to fetch the psalms up to mark but he didn't catch on somehow wonder the duchess can stand him with his horrid correctness she's fond of doing herself well thought the duchess had rather a shoppin face replied the man meaning that his hostess had looked worried don't know why she should got heaps of cake to chew might be she missed demetrius where say hang out don't know went prancing off on his own got a puff the inheritor of algy's shoes provided the lady with a cigarette fancied she cottoned to thaskew chap he remarked striking a match sure she did oh rather aksakoff let on to me bout the boy jumping paris to get fixed british embassy fixings you know leah pentland didn't bring it off somehow lucky for her seeing jim wasn't a goner we really could not have received her ended mrs penworthy then aware that she had lapsed into decent english corrected her mistake mean we couldn't have let her chip into our game like the duchess inquired her companion languidly don't know quite saucy and swagger and all that freezes a bit what talks like a book you know awfully expensive rattle the man nodded thought she wasn't up to dick dare say she'll spin along on her own freely when the hump's off hump she hasn't got the hump or the needle either very saucy hump insisted the male linguist quite birdish sorry the old duke and frith hopped maybe how very unnatural sighed mrs penworthy reverting to english in her disgust quite too awful to think how luck hooks on to her really makes one wish to be a bad woman to see how she lands the salmon she finished more creditably algy's latest successor was right for once in his life of mistakes leah was not entirely her own brilliant self notwithstanding that successful inauguration of the new era the early excitement consequent on the conversation with aksakoff had died away and again she felt the old haunting fear of the possible but this absurd mood she hoped would pass away when the test came facing her enemies male and female she would doubtless fight like a cornered rat and would conquer from sheer determination not to be beaten nevertheless this period of suspense was trying to one who had no listener and who could not talk herself into heroics by mere monologues a confident but necessary only to the weaker part of her character since her deepest feelings had advised her that pure strength must needs be solitary she was an oak not an ivy and unknowingly agreed with emerson as to the vitiating effects of comfortable circumstances cast the bantling on the rocks sang the seer of concord and leah indubitably squirmed thereon as jim had informed her in his simple way in a conversation now apparently some centuries old every month's a year now sighed leah wearily however pending a possible fight for her social throne the duchess made the very best of the passing hour after the pagan entertainment of the winter solstice she endured the gorging christianity of a few belated country houses whose inhabitants were still eating in honour of a birth which had taken place some two thousand years ago as a book they seldom read assured them she went alone to these vitalian feasts as jim was off the chain until such time as he would be needed to play duke during the season the aristocratic prodigal's reformation was but skin-deep 
and the late whitewash soon wore off to show the unchanged black fleece since he began with the zeal of a newly uniformed subaltern to poach on various matrimonial manners mrs penworthy he had naturally grown tired of as she preferred syndicates to partnerships so he placed his tried affections on lady sandal who was horsey and doggy and tremendously expensive on account of her betting craze she and jim talked kennels and stables discussing their very unplatonic loves between times and found each other kindred gutter snipes of the earthly sensual kind leah speedily informed by a feminine tide-wind of this new amusement of jim's four-and-twenty leisure hours did not object or even hint her knowledge of his backsliding it kept him out of her way and lord sandal a nero with limitations who dwelt in a superlative glass house was not likely to submit his wife's latest sin to the fierce light which beats upon the divorce court witness box nothing could be more satisfactory to a woman who wanted complete freedom and leah again thanked the agreeable fetish for making straight her very crooked paths but all this time the sword dangled over leah's head and its menace became so insupportable that she wished the single hair would give way to decide brusquely for hit or miss her desire was gratified on the very night when she made her curtsy to the sovereigns having created an immense impression the duchess with eyes as radiant as the family diamonds crowning her imperial head returned at midnight to her home in the company of a purring husband jim really felt that leah had upheld the family name with her insolent beauty and moreover was quite the grandest-looking woman in london or out of it when they arrived in their own drawing-room and she had emerged a royal court butterfly from the chrysalis of her cloak he turned abruptly and took her in his arms with the hug of a bear leah he murmured hoarsely oh leah and kissed her fair on the mouth with the kiss of pan but only once did he exercise that connubial privilege for she released herself roughly with a sense of intolerable outrage isn't it rather late in the day she asked scornful and angry upon my word leah i'd be a good husband to you if you would only let me oh as an over-married turk i am sure you would be admirable i know you disapprove of monogamy what the deuce is that something that the church encourages and society shirks the sander woman can explain the objection jim winced at her knowledge of his latest love you said that i belonged to you he reminded her sulkily officially may i ask the reason for this sudden devotion you look so rippin thanks for the belated compliment i am aware that your love is dependent upon the eye and what else should it be dependent upon the heart may have something to do with it you know or rather you do not know since our conversation when i asked you to buy a yacht i have given up trying to educate you in the affections i'll buy a yacht now a dozen yachts to please you oh said the duchess with a cold smile so that epsom new market woman has been nasty jim uttered a bad word under his breath and flung out of the room in a pet i'll play at the club till all's blue he called out while banging the door and a minute later she heard the butler whistle for a hansom the deserted wife was perfectly aware that jim's sudden admiration arose from pride of proprietorship and objected to be cajoled into righteous matrimonial principles on such terms as it was scarcely one o'clock she seated herself to consider if it would be worth while to lift her uxorious pig out of the mire he loved a footman with a salver interrupted these creditable meditations a lady called twice to see your grace this evening said the man presenting a visiting card and has now called again the duchess lifted her eyebrows as she lifted the card at this hour the lady says her business is important your grace what business here her eyes fell on the card and a swift alteration of expression changed her into a different and harder woman ask mademoiselle aksakoff to join me here she ordered abruptly the sword had not yet dropped but the hair could not suspend it much longer katinka was in england in london in her house and demetrius what of him why had he not come also leah asked herself these questions with brutal directness resolved to shirk nothing of the imminent danger 
after the first dash of dismay her nerves braced themselves for the ordeal and she advanced to greet mademoiselle aksakoff with a conventional smile meaning nothing and yet everything this gave place to an amazed look when she beheld the haggard antagonist with whom she had to cross swords my dear girl what have you been doing with yourself she might well ask katinka was no longer the demure nun but a fierce goaded creature of the feline tribe dressed quietly in unrelieved black hatted cloaked and gloved she presented the appearance of one sorely tried in the fiery furnace of affliction and less lucky than daniel's brethren that thin worn face those hollow eyes the wry mouth the dark hair plentifully bestreaked with grey she was demoralised uncanny and aggressively cruel in a flash the duchess knew that this untimely visitor knew the truth and was prepared to do battle no quarter would be given by katinka aksakoff and leah with a deep breath braced herself for an armageddon duel the contrast between the dowdy russian girl and the magnificently arrayed woman lay entirely in the garb otherwise they were cats of the wildest their faces took on a marked resemblance a stealthy cunning sly guarded expression effaced their ordinary looks if katinka's eyes gleamed dangerously so did those of leah if leah held herself like a pantheress about to spring so did katinka in that splendid room two prehistoric creatures were about to fight over the male here indeed was woman the female of man civilization was nowhere you know why i have come asked katinka in a voice as hard as her eyes and those might have been fashioned of granite leah with flattened ears so to speak professed ignorance she did not intend to criticise until fully aware of facts a shake of her head conveyed the denial and brought forth one bitter word liar the duchess glanced towards the door remembering that the servants had not yet retired and might be within earshot would you mind speaking in a lower tone she suggested between her teeth for the insult struck home sit down ordered katinka imperiously i prefer to stand retorted her antagonist fighting for the inch mademoiselle aksakoff advanced one step and her eyes probed those of the duchess without words the situation was adjusted and in leah's favour for the russian suddenly sat down with a quick indrawn breath by that action the woman who had done the wrong knew that she was the stronger of the two and a tyrannical instinct to bully the weak rose hotly in her breast what do you mean by coming at this late hour and misbehaving she demanded harshly you know well what i mean pardon me i never profess to understand the vagaries of a mad woman at this brutal speech katinka's hand shot into her pocket but leah did not move a weapon she asked sneeringly that would be quite in keeping with your blatant nationality foreigners are so fond of the melodramatic the girl withdrew her hand quietly you are too poor a creature to kill lady james leah smiled at the old title and passed the remark with a contemptuous shrug later on perhaps who knows who indeed it is impossible to foresee what an hysterical lunatic will do do you propose to shoot or stab me or to blow me up i understand that bombs are favoured in your happy country the crude hostility of this speech was plainly intended to infuriate the slav woman but it missed the mark aimed at katinka looked at the mocker gravely how afraid you are leah shrugged again the remark was too futile to be commented upon yes you are went on the other a trifle roused else you would have me turned out by your servants later on perhaps who knows repeated the duchess using the girl's own words then continued soothingly no i shall not call the servants and make a scandal since your father is my friend your accomplice lady james what an unpleasant word and how very unsuitable for what you did in paris i did nothing in paris to deserve such a word perhaps you mean something else you foreigners know the grammar of english but rarely the meaning of words i remarked the same defect in your father i have no father indeed i have not yet heard of his death 
your misunderstanding of my meaning is pretence ignorance i assure you and as it grows late and i am tired may i ask you to explain your business i can do so in one word demetrius katinka rose to give full force of expression to the name and her voice rose with the utterance leah remained perfectly calm and indulged in badinage demetrius oh yes that horrid little man with the waxed moustache a doctor or a chemist wasn't he your lover oh no i have no use for that sort of person if i had i should certainly not pick one out of the gutter demetrius yes she went on musingly but watchful of her enemy i had almost forgotten him he went to st petersburg didn't he and you loved him i remember a queer choice i thought at the time well have you married him it grows late and you are tired mocked katinka successfully keeping her temper and thereby disappointing the duchess we had better not waste time leah yawned it seems to me that we have been doing nothing else since you came in demetrius is in england really how very interesting as doctor or prince as an escaped siberian felon no leah's face assumed a skilful expression of mingled pity and horror poor little man he was mad to go to russia i thought so when i read his letter which i sent you the forged letter don't be silly one would think you were on the stage katinka bit her lip to prevent furious speech and locked her arms behind her as though she feared lest temper should engender violence leah noted her expression however and retreated towards the bell you are talking nonsense she said coldly as much as i respect your father i shall certainly summon the servants to put you out and let you go at once i shall not go and you shall not order your servants to put me out cried katinka fiercely i defy you to press the button of the bell with a feeling that the girl has scored on this occasion leah withdrew her hand making the usual excuse for your father's sake i spare you the indignity i repeat that i have no father and i repeat that i am tired what do you want you must arrange with me to see constantine who is constantine you know i do not you do their eyes met and this time leah won the victory over a woman obviously worn out constantine is demetrius explained the russian in a fatigued voice and closing her eyes oh my god she dropped into her seat with a low wail and covered her face leah heard the clock strike the half hour through the sobs of her visitor she was absolutely sure that katinka was at her mercy and wished to dismiss her beaten and crushed but first it was necessary to learn why demetrius had not come also leah moved swiftly towards the broken creature and laid a firm hand on her heaving shoulder my dear she got no further with the elusive spring of a wild animal katinka flung off the hand reared and struck out the blow fell fairly on leah's mouth and she found herself mopping up the blood of a deeply cut lip before she had any clear idea of what had taken place oh you liar you beast you devil cried the russian with the savagery of a cow muck tent woman i could kill you kill you mad mumbled leah with the lace handkerchief to her lips i am sane retorted the other swiftly i know all you lured constantine to paris you sold him to my father to hide your iniquity i saw helfmann the spy do you hear the spy i bribed him it took months to bribe him but in the end i bought the truth my father shame to my father drugged constantine at your table and helfmann as a sham doctor took him to havre to kronstadt to moscow the grand duke sergius here she spat when mentioning the hated name yes he that beast of beasts sent him to siberia for life ah for life do you hear judas jezebel animal that you are i followed there i followed the man i loved and who did not love you muttered the duchess rocking with the pain of her swollen and bleeding lips she had seated herself by this time and did not seek to stem the torrents of insults and why katinka flung back her head and her nostrils dilated because you stole his heart that he might do your evil bidding but he loves me now with all his heart and soul he loves me now i went to tomsk to aid his escape i followed to sakhalin i waited and waited eating my heart out oh my heart she laid her hand on her breast oh my breaking heart 
we escaped he did i did we escaped do you hear you who sold him there were months of terror and sorrow and cruel cold but god was good he was kinder than man more merciful than you who damned a soul to that frozen hell god the good god whom i adore and worship she fell on her knees striking her hands together he aided us to reach the waiting ship of strange and strange leah rose shaken and sick strange katinka leaped up to face her the man you bribed with six thousand pounds to take your sin on his soul i know all about your wickedness strange knows constantine knows we will tell the world what we know and you shamed disgraced beaten hounded out of your world ah down will you fall fall unless unless leah gripping a chair and swaying looked up unless you come to south end to see constantine i refuse then i tell everything i go to your husband leah in spite of her pain laughed at the idea i go to your police i tell stop i shall come since you insist upon it i do constantine likewise he is ill very ill his eyes are blinded by the glare of the snows whither you sent him he is oh my poor angel my patient saint he is stopping abruptly she looked with an evil eye at the woman she had so shamefully marked i will leave you to see the wreck you have made of him you will come the duchess nodded but i can explain all she mumbled explain it then to constantine said her enemy contemptuously i go now meet me to-morrow at liverpool street station at the barrier we can go to south end by the five o'clock train constantine is on board strange's ship which lies off south end ah then you mean to carry you away no you are not worth it leah's indomitable courage quelled for the moment blazed up fiercely she forgot her pain her disfigured mouth and faced katinka in a blind rage you you she clenched her hands and panted like a spent runner you have said all i agree to all the russian looked at the wounded mouth with a cruel calm smile then sauntered deliberately to the door there she smiled still more serenely pointed a mocking finger at her enemy's wry mouth and slipped away without a word and almost without a sound leah sprang to the mirror had this woman marred her beauty the mouth was swollen the lips still bleeding there were wounds within and without and a rather loose tooth leah could have howled aloud at the shame the humiliation of her defeat that she should be struck beaten mastered she of all women she she ah she cried but softly mindful of danger then the thought came to her that she would have to account for her damaged mouth and with the thought came enlightenment passing quickly out of the room she ascended the stairs rapidly to her room half way up she stumbled and fell the footman hearing the fall ran up and lifted her he saw that her mouth was bleeding natural enough oh perfectly natural it's them beastly long trains explained the footman in the servants hall End of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of lady jim of curzon street this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lady jim of curzon street by fergus hume chapter thirty two never knew you to tumble before leah grumbled the duke next morning when admitted into his wife's bedroom accidents will happen murmured the duchess rather lamely and too much shaken to be original i can't talk jim my mouth is still sore what can you expect if you go a mucker and the season's startin too you'll not be able to show with that swellin a week at firmingham will put me right katinka aksakoff is coming down also heard she looked in last night what made her call at so late an hour she's worried about her father lied leah prepared for the question had an almighty row with him over that bounder doctor i expect leah nodded languidly monsieur aksakoff has gone to south end i take his daughter with me there to make peace south end there's a hole what's he doin in that roost how should i know i'll reconcile the two if i can and katinka can be my companion at firmingham dull company confessed jim candidly she never could flirt 
that will be no drawback said his wife dryly go away please what lie am i to tell about your sickness tell the truth by way of a novelty or if you prefer a lie say that i have appendicitis one must be fashionable even in diseases all right said jim too obtuse to note the irony sorry you're so ill you've made an awful mess of yourself women will wear such confounded trains good-bye at present i'll look in at firmingham during your week of penance and talking himself out of the room jim went about his ordinary nefarious occupations feeling that he had behaved as a husband should the duchess turned wearily on her pillows and winced not with pain for her mouth though still swollen was much less tender it was the prospect before her that hurt in the evening a difficult interview had to be got through somehow and her brain began to forecast the probable result if katinka could be believed it would scarcely prove to be a pleasant one demetrius apparently intended to punish her by blackening an unsoiled character such a nasty revengeful spirit thought leah feeling ill-used and depressed but after all what could the man say likely to incriminate her seeing that she had moved amongst the pitfalls of the plot as delicately as agag demetrius had conceived and executed the entire scheme and what could he say would only fit in neatly with strange's confession which the public already knew and condemned her hand could not be traced either in his parisian journey or in the drugging of the tea how was she to know that helfmann was a police spy or that the letter assuring her of the doctor's intended return to russia had been deftly forged her surface behaviour at least was perfectly honest and would bear even the scrutiny of an interviewer she could taking a broad view of unpleasant circumstances defy the creature but nevertheless felt instinctively that it would be unwise to dare him to do his worst such a plodding narrow-minded sneaking beast would ruin himself to ruin her and mud if thrown persistently was apt to stick even to the whitest robe what a shame that this animal should so persecute her how hard on a kind-hearted woman whose sin as he called it was merely an error of judgment by the time leah finished her reflections her frame of mind was one of much injured innocence later in the day when driving to liverpool street station to keep her hated appointment leah half decided to call on aksakoff but second thoughts assured her that his intervention was quite out of the question were demetrius to be arrested in british waters the radical press would howl and nasty meddling politicians would ask unnecessary questions in the commons it would be wiser after all to fight alone and to the bitter end if demetrius thought she would give in demetrius was entirely mistaken he had yet to learn that she could be as nasty as hitherto she had been nice but he was horridly ungrateful as all men were in this way did the arch plotter salve her countenance and compose her mind it was darkish when the brougham arrived at the station and leah glancing about under the electric lamps saw katinka waiting at the ticket barrier for the benefit of an inquisitive maid and an observant groom she addressed her gaily though it was not easy to speak with still aching lips you are punctual said the duchess pressing an unwilling hand with ostentatious warmth excuse my speaking much i fell on the stairs last night after you left and hurt my mouth i commiserate with you madame replied katinka sarcastically so good of you i hope m aksakoff will not expect me to chatter my father echoed the girl staring he is at south end isn't he said leah impatiently at least you told me so last night i have instructed my maid to go on to firmingham while we travel straight to south end such a cockney place isn't it then we can get back oh about what time say eleven o'clock returned the russian grimly she now saw through the clever comedy which was being played you understand marie said leah turning to her maid who was all ears and eyes see that the broom is sent in time come with me dear there's a reserved compartment at least i ordered one curl go and look thus prattling to deceive her domestics leah adjusted a very thick veil which hid from the public a face whose expression was quite at variance with her sweet nothings when the two entered the carriage and the train was moving slowly out of the station katinka burst into a harsh laugh i congratulate you lady james you should have been a conspirator so your dear father told me compliments run in your family apparently 
surely you do not blame me for putting things right with my servants they might think it queer otherwise and one cannot be too careful with such creatures i fail to see what good your exceedingly clever explanations will do constantine intends to speak out what about asked leah chafing and throwing up her veil to manage the girl more easily with her dominating eyes katinka always fiery and with slack nerves after her siberian experiences almost lost what temper she had left need we keep on your comedy madame i'm sure i do not know what you mean one would think that i wished to deceive people the way you talk and after what i have done for you too it's most ungrateful and pray what have you done lady james don't call me lady james your stupid mistakes get on my nerves done why i pretended to fall on the stair to excuse the state of my mouth had i been a nasty spiteful creature such as you are i should have given you in charge for assault give me in charge now sneered the girl i might don't drive me into a corner you are inconsistent if you have done nothing wrong how can i drive you into the corner you speak of because you are a monomaniac retorted the duchess angrily you seem to think that i am the cause of the doctor's exile i of all people who would not hurt a fly you would hurt a dozen flies if anything was to be gained snapped the other irritably you betrayed my constantine i did nothing of the sort as he will understand when he hears what i have to say hearing and believing are two different things lady james leah shrugged away the speech of course you are prejudiced because demetrius loves me mademoiselle aksakoff fetched a long deep breath do not try me too far do you intend to assault me again no i even apologized for the blow i told constantine this morning of my interview and he said that i was wrong it is for him to deal you justice and punishment punishment justice leah laughed aloud in sheer rage at her inability to parry these insults and for what pray constantine will tell you in that case i do not wish a second-hand judgment from you the two glared at one another venomous and defiant as usual the younger woman's eyes fell first and she retreated to the furthermost corner of the carriage while leah pulling down her veil tried to face this most disagreeable situation not another word did they exchange until the ducal servants branched off at shenfield junction and they had to be publicly amiable then again silence reigned until their destination was reached by that time leah was more her old insolent self and disposed to be unpleasant will you drive or walk asked katinka coldly when they alighted on the south end platform walk of course i do not mind at all being recognised since i have come to see your father on board this yacht captain strange would be flattered by your description the duchess laughed contemptuously as they stepped into the street i am scarcely responsible for m aksakoff's notion of a yacht foreigners are so ignorant they are not so clever as englishmen or english women except in trickery and blackmail where they surpass them retorted leah her petty rage insisting on having the last word katinka permitted her the gratification and they walked the whole length of the high street in grim silence at a rude quay jutting from the beach of the lower town they boarded a disreputable boat rowed by two pirates and steered by a third the night was starry but moonless comparatively calm and noticeably chilly leah shivered as the boat made for a vivid green riding light which shone an emerald star no great distance from the shore but her shiver might have been an admission of dread katinka took it to be so and smiled in a gratified way as her enemy climbed the side of the steamer which was a veritable gypsy of the sea untidy dirty and decidedly questionable in honest eyes strange did the honours loud-tongued and raucous guess it do my eyes good to see your grace was his welcome hold your tongue and don't use my title she replied furiously strange as milk of human kindness turned sour on the instant i ain't highfalutin enough i s'pose pity i ain't a dandy skipper of sorts all hair oil and giddy gold tags 
leah turned her back without deigning a reply and looked inquiringly at katinka the girl with an enigmatic smile on her wan face led the way down some greasy stairs into a stuffy state-room and opened the narrow door of a side cabin leah entered and heard the lock click behind her evidently mademoiselle aksakoff did not think it judicious to remain but i dare say her ear is at the keyhole thought the duchess contemptuously she was trying to preserve her self-respect by heaping obloquy on her rival but scarcely succeeded as well as she desired then she said ugh twice and with emphasis the interjections were not meant for the girl's possible eavesdropping but to show leah's disgust at the close atmosphere of the cabin it was a nauseous musky sickly odour which reminded her only too vividly of the monkey-house at the zoo neither light nor air entered the den save through the round porthole over the bunk which was unscrewed but even the briny sea-breeze blowing softly could not do away with that thick tainted atmosphere which had provoked the visitor's exclamations with her handkerchief to her mouth leah's eyes strove to become accustomed to the faint light she saw dimly a heap of blankets but no form was visible beneath and no face was to be seen possible trickery occurred to her until a voice came heavily through the fetid gloom then in spite of its odd strangled sound she felt instinctively that demetrius was buried somewhere under the clothes you will excuse the absence of a lamp madame my eyes are half blinded with the snow glare and very tender how strangely you speak remarked leah involuntarily a sore throat was the hoarse reply siberia as madame must be aware is not a summer climate the wheezy sound ended in a kind of piping whistle i am sorry you have suffered said the duchess at a loss what to say ugh the smell she thought seating herself on a locker and feeling almost too sick to control her faculties madame is too good a dangerous pause ensued while leah wondered what was about to happen the man assuredly was demetrius and demetrius was assuredly extremely ill it was within the bounds of possibility that he might spring up and kill her the thought did not trouble her overmuch so dangerous a business had to be faced undauntedly and she kept down her womanly weakness with masculine strength during those slow minutes she could hear the lapping of the waters on which the vessel rocked hear also the laboured breathing of the sick man this stopped for a moment and then did she hear her own easy breaths demetrius evidently heard them also and had paused to listen he laughed weakly softly clucking like a fowl madame is very brave i'm frightened to death she assured him to excite his pity your breathing tells me otherwise i am certain madame that your pulse beats regularly and that your nerves are entirely in order is this a consultation she asked coolly it is the farewell of two who loved murmured the hard thick voice muffled by the blankets that is madame of one who loved and of one who did not and therein as monsieur heine truly remarks lies the tragedy of existence demetrius constantine leah felt that she must come to the point and get rapidly through the interview if only to escape from the sickening atmosphere katinka accuses me of betraying you well madame i did not i swear i did not indeed mademoiselle aksakoff is doubtless mistaken in a way she wishes to save her father from blame as a good daughter should will you explain further madame certainly i came of my own free will to explain katinka told me how ill you were and i could not bear to think you should die believing me to be dishonourable madame speaks hopefully of my dying it would please her perhaps no what do you take me for i never loved you as you wish to be loved but if monsieur aksakoff had not interfered and we had married i should have come to love you you speak of what might have been i suppose so circumstances are altered marriage is out of the question assuredly 
and i am scarcely fit for a bridegroom what is the matter with you asked leah anxiously demetrius passed over the question besides captain strange informed me that your husband has returned madame was doubtless pleased at that marvellous resurrection so cleverly managed no said leah honestly enough i was not but circumstances made it imperative that jim should return and for me to travel in siberia blame m aksakoff blame m aksakoff she insisted i am innocent be pleased to observe madame that as yet i have brought no accusation against you katinka acted as your mouthpiece you have not my authority to say that then i gather that you do not blame me for your exile how can i with any truth madame seeing that you accuse m aksakoff i do said leah resolutely in that case i regret that mademoiselle struck the wrong person you know that she struck me i was informed of it this morning and expressed my regret that she acted so foolishly did the blow hurt you it was most painful i feel it still your lip is cut then both lips inside luckily so there will be no visible scars but even now a very little would make them bleed such was the profound egotism of her nature that she expected further sympathy from the man she had reduced to such a condition but the doctor's stock of polite phrases appeared to be exhausted in place of a compliment came a hoarse chuckle like the cry of an early starling you appear to approve said leah ironically pardon i mentioned before that mademoiselle in my humble opinion was wrong she was very wrong i am not accustomed to deal with wild beasts spare me madame i owe her so much i owe her nothing except revenge for striking me but i excuse that because she is ignorant of the truth i am also ignorant madame you shall hear it now yes the absolute truth again came the raucous sound which might have been a laugh or a groan leah could not tell which the truth murmured the sick man adding after a significant pause i am waiting madame i went to paris with miss tallentire explained the duchess beginning anywhere in her hurry and mr askew followed followed you certainly not i always detested the boy so conceited he admired miss tallentire and his liking for me was the passing fancy of a shallow nature to arouse your jealousy m aksakoff put it about that mr askew intended to marry me in paris the gossip and it was merely gossip came to mrs penworthy's ears that woman hated me then and hates me now to make mischief she told you you came over to paris there you remember what took place not at our final meeting my last memory of your face is seeing it across the tea-table you had a fit of some kind and m aksakoff called up a dr helfmann who took you away in a cab to be cured then i received a letter from you stating that you were going to russia as i fancied you might have settled with m aksakoff about your pardon of course i quite believed it and and i think that is all did you not know that the letter was forged no that the so-called dr helfmann was a spy no that the coffee or rather that the tea was drugged no how could i possibly know that m aksakoff was using me as his tool if the tea it was tea well if he put anything into the tea i did not see him do it it was m aksakoff who gave you into dr helfmann's charge when you were insensible now am i to blame your explanation is eminently satisfactory madame and you believe me it would be impolite to doubt a lady leah was nonplussed 
she was manufacturing conversation and his comments were trivial if not ironical as she shrewdly suspected she could not quite arrive at his real meaning he avoided answering leading questions and would neither accept nor decline her asseverations i have no more to say she remarked with an air of one washing her hands of the whole affair again a deadly silence ensued again she heard the heavy breathing of the creature hidden under the heaped blankets again sounded the drowsy lapping of the water and the faint sigh of the wind this time she resolved to make him speak so that she might learn precisely what he thought but the moments passed and no speech came finally it did come in the unemotional voice of one who speaks in his sleep he discoursed on a subject about which he had no desire to hear paris havre kronstadt said the slow drawling monotonous tone and then the weary journey across the urals oh the cold and the snows and the bitter storms of siberia chains and hunger dirt and rags and always always the hopeless future none loved me none lifted me up none spoke words of kindness loneliness and sorrow and the constant torment of painful memories the voice died away in a sob leah desperately anxious to defend herself still further would have spoken but her mouth was dry her lips ached tremors thrilled her body as the nerves twittered jumped and quivered over the low bunk she could see the rocking stars as the vessel swung to her anchor what glimmer of light there was revealed faintly the piled blankets and nothing more the face was veiled by almost material shadows and again drearily and heavily rose the thick muddy voice without variance in its tones without the music of feeling it might have been and probably was a voice from the tomb as it surged sluggishly through the fetid gloom st petersburg announced the toneless voice moscow and the farce of a trial the waving of a white-gloved hand and a courtly bow to dismiss me into pain and darkness and to a living grave nijni novgorod and mother volga who takes us convicts to her breast here came the dry chanting of a weird song which made the listener's flesh creep and her guilty soul quail then again slowly wearily demetrius began to name the stations of his cross on the way to the cavalry of a final prison kazan pianibor perm the bleak urals that prison wall of the exile ekka terenberg tiumen the doorstep to the barren cell borka dobruna oshalka the rough russian names grated on leah's ears yevlevoy and the slow flowing river the prison barge the black bread the bitter biting burning cold tobolsk with its deathly mists and clammy darkness of egypt the charity song the weary weary milo surd naya he sang another line or two in a cracked voice and broke out more humanly than the warm sunshine like the smile of the good god and days of those gentle winds we shall never breathe more the flowers and the winds the sunshine and the laughing children samarov surgalf narim he paused to gather strength for the crying of a name which issued with a sob of heartfelt agony tomsk oh 
tomsk those long long days of waiting for what was to be the horrible mercies of the unjust kiri leison christ leison kiri leison she saw the convulsive movements of the blankets and knew that he was making the sign of the cross after the crying to god and his son came the protest against the cruelty of man the weary prison of tomsk the road the long horrible road to the ice-bound coast sakhalin the island of pain the hell of the innocent and a human soul lost Christe et leison a loving sinning soul for which thou didst die lost 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 leah's nerves ached and shook and shuddered as the account of the vile journey welled forth smoothly like thick oil with fixed eyes and fascinated ears she took in the terrible odyssey after another sobbing pause the broken creature was crying bitterly the voice recommenced droning on one note until leah felt that she could have screamed if only to vary the sound demetrius spoke of the barren wastes of sakhalin in the gulf of akask where the freezing straits of Naviski run between mainland and island he told of obdurate cossacks of cruel jailers of the treacherous gilyak natives who prevent the escape of the mortal damned a note of emotion crept into the voice and in its level tones she discerned a faint hope a smuggled letter and the assurance that help was at hand a corrupted warder a bribed soldier a black starless night and a desperate escape over deserts of snow then came heart-rending relations of a drifting boat of suffering and starvation and cold which burnt to the bone leah heard of a brave woman my love my love said the voice tenderly toiling with a bought japanese fisherman to bring the tiny shallop to a haven beyond the grip of the merciless muscovite the weird tale took her through la perouse straits northward amongst the Kuril islands and into the naked lands of kamchatka here again as she gathered the fugitives were in danger of recapture but they fled still further north through the bitter cold and under a bleak sunless sky to herd with the koriaks the tormented voice droned ever on about these filthy savages fish-eaters and hunters of the unclean it shuddered through accounts of loathsome diseases and of smoky defiled huts like the hells of swedenborg and the man wailed always ever and again of the danger of being retaken of terrible suspense of shattered nerves and of the eternal strength of a pure woman's love the tale ended with painful outbursts of joy at the sight of strangers tramps standing towards the inhospitable siberian coast peace plenty warmth food safety kindness hope love chanted the voice broken up into almost musical gratitude then a pause of infinite meaning ended by a dry clucking chuckle and i lived that i might see you breathe the man she had cast into the hell he had described leah's hair bristled at the roots the speech was so terribly significant but her soul still fought against the inevitable punishment whatever that might be not my fault she panted eagerly horrible horrible but not my fault oh believe believe me constantine you have asserted your innocence before murmured the sick man ironically and now now her heart almost stood still so intensely did she listen we must part for ever but you you i devote what remains of my life to the woman who has saved me to the angel who drew me out of the frozen deeps of hell
and and you you will say nothing this boat leaves here to-night for a place which needs not be mentioned i go out of your life for ever and silent oh thank you thank you for what madame since you assure me of your innocence leah felt awkward she had said too much katinka is so prejudiced that i thought i thought her voice died away the lie would not come forth in the presence of this dying wretch you thought she would be jealous ah no madame demetrius paused and clucked again like a brooding hen she permits you to kiss me with a last kiss no leah half rose and fell again recoiling with a cry of terror at the prospect of setting the final seal on her treachery as did judas in the garden i beg of you my first love one kiss to dismiss me into the silence to close my mouth for ever and ever so he did doubt her he did not believe all her lies were discounted all his conversation was merely ironical and make-believe he held her in a vice and release would come only when she submitted to a revolting caress i will not i dare not she stammered shrinking against the wall in an agony of physical fear from an object which a guilty imagination revealed as loathsome to sight and touch you you have no right to the right of love said the weary voice you have no proof the cipher letters and a lean hand held out a packet drawn from under the discoloured blankets for one kiss madame for one kiss ugh groaned leah and snatched eagerly packet and hand disappeared swiftly and the voice whistled in a jeering manner one kiss madame one kiss she still fought my mouth is sore i am one kiss one kiss the last and the best or or leah writhing against the wall gasped soundlessly in that last word there was the sound of a terrible threat it was the knell of respectability of ease and luxury and of all that makes life worth living a single caress would buy the evidence a touch of her mouth and she would be free for ever and ever and ever one kiss then she muttered and with all her soul crying strenuously against the horror she tottered forward one her lips sought the place where a mouth might be supposed to be waiting two arms flew up and gripped her she could not scream for the arms dragged her down belted her like iron bands her mouth was on his his lips were on hers she writhed silent and agonized in the horrible caress in the abominable embrace trying to free herself in vain demetrius placed his lean hand on the back of her head and absolutely ground her mouth against his own she could feel the wounds break and bleed sanctifying the kiss of judas his arms relaxed she flung backward and the long withheld scream broke forth shrill and vehement as if in answer to that terrible summons katinka tore open the door and entered with a smoky paraffin lamp with one hand the girl thrust the shaking sobbing woman forward with the other held the lamp towards the face peering out of the blankets oh my god shrieked leah and sprang from the cabin pursued by the cackling of broken laughter she made for the deck 
for the side for anywhere to be out of the sight of that face that face which would haunt her till she died strange in silence handed her sobbing and whimpering down the black side where the boat received her she dropped in a heap and beside her dropped from katinka's hand a packet of letters above from an open porthole came clucking cackling chuckling laughter insanely gleeful and the silent stars of god shone over land and sea End of chapter 32chapter thirty three of lady jim of curzon street this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lady jim of curzon street by fergus hume chapter thirty three so leah won after all she went out with a definite purpose and returned with that purpose achieved yet not fully since what she desired had been flung to her as a bone to a dog in the panic-stricken flight from the field she carried with her the spoils of victory and something less desirable the price of her good name the security of her position the entire triumph these as she well knew had been gained by shameful self-surrender indeed it could scarcely be called a victory seeing that she had succumbed to the masterful brutality of her enemy nevertheless and she derived comfort from the thought it could not be termed a defeat her social glory yet flamed unextinguished her character could not be smirched and she could yet hold up her head to flout the found out of her sex but something bitter spoiled the flavour of these sweets she had lost her belief in the fetish its spell of good luck was broken her nerve was gone and with it self-respect all she desired was to hide herself amongst familiar surroundings that their very familiarity might fence in her quailing soul from impossible danger and that the danger could be so described by her intellect revealed a demoralized will the cipher letters attesting her share in the conspiracy she destroyed by fire they were genuinely those she had written and the number was correct so when their ashes floated up the chimney leah drew the long deep relieved breath of one whose chains had been struck off yet even at the moment of release she shuddered to the core of her being the ghost of a feudal crime was laid but the ghost might return demetrius had truly parted with all tangible evidence and his unsubstantiated story would be whiffed away as too romantic for belief moreover m aksakoff for the sake of his own good name and that of his government would swear to her innocence of this gross intrigue she was safe absolutely entirely and wholly safe the world would never know how she had capered on the verge of an abyss or how nearly she had missed her footing but something her conscience probably told her that an unseen judge was summing up her delinquencies that she was being weighed in the balance and would be found wanting even though her kingdom did not pass from her this judge impartial terribly quiet severely righteous might have been god and he was god although she refused recognition her tormented soul inspired her with a dread of an all-seeing and condemning eye but she resolutely declined to admit the maker the judge or the unseen in any way shadows should not frighten her for these were not of the eating drinking merry-making world all the same shadows elusive and unexpected did strike terror to her guilty heart and she reluctantly knew herself to be a broken woman in those earlier hours of safety this knowledge was very insistent 
the week of her retirement passed pleasantly enough she doctored her bruised lips mended their torn skin and argued occasionally with her shameful soul the quiet life of silent hours in the midst of civilized balms partially restored her courage but not as entirely as she could wish piecing her broken nerves together as best she could she strove to remount the pinnacle of supreme and self-sufficient egotism whence she had fallen but humpty dumpty could not be set up again try as she might to replace him during those brooding hours leah recovered much but not all the week's end found her cured of the skin-deep blow and outward the same insolent radiant beauty of an adoring world but she knew herself to be a changed being the pantheress had become a hare although less innocent the sword of her tongue was still sharp but the shield of self-righteousness was broken and a keen-eyed antagonist sufficiently assertive could have reduced her to the same moral pulp that the interview with demetrius had left her woe to the vanquished indeed what remained but that she should receive the wooden foil of retirement from destiny and leave the arena for ever her soul protested against this tame submission so with indomitable courage she braced herself to further battle with the world that is not with demetrius his abominable kiss had sapped her forces she could face social enemies she could defy the eternal she could encounter the fiends of hell but not the man who had flung her into the dust who had trailed her and was still trailing her at his chariot wheels certainly he had steamed into the unknown and she would never behold him more but his black influence remained and made itself felt at untoward moments jim paid his promised visit almost at the end of her seclusion and was disposed to be disagreeable on the plea that his wife had lied unnecessarily being truthful himself when there was nothing to be gained by swerving from the path of rectitude jim abhorred a wasted fib and proceeded to condemn leah for shooting an aimless arrow from her mental quiver it was the most pensive hour of the summer twilight when jim began his sermon and he preached in his wife's sitting-room darby sat beside joan who lay languidly on a sofa what a perfect and touching picture of connubial felicity if only a reporter of backstair gossip had been present to describe this middle-class domesticity of these great leaders of fashion brixton might have learned an edifying lesson from belgravia now i do call it hard on a fellow complained the duke jolly hard that you can't talk straight leah if i did you would scarcely feel flattered what is it now aksakoff says he was never near south end swore till all was blue that he'd never set eyes on that girl for months and months a sad deprivation for so affectionate a father well then he wants to know where she is how should i know replied the duchess indifferently she chose to remain at south end and i returned here alone what were you doing at south end that is my business jim mine also you said something that wasn't true really the accuser of the brethren in the pulpit with a vengeance the duke stared i don't know what you mean i am quite sure you don't stop talking please i am too ill to be worried rats said jim elegantly you look like a picture then permit me the privilege of one and do not ask for replies the duke strolled to the window in a huff and surveyed his property with sulky looks leah sat up on her sofa and pondered as to how much she should say and how much leave unsaid jim had always been under the impression that demetrius had done his dirty work for money and the truth would not probably strike him as amusing leah could easily have conceived and told a pretty fairy tale as she was always resourceful in the way of fiction but the sight of his pink fatuous face filled her with rage why should he be a beast with women and she a vestal with men was not sauce for the gander sauce for the goose also she determined to tell him the whole brutal affair with certain reservations concerning the betrayal of demetrius jim had few moral scruples but what he had would be averse to the betrayal of an accomplice however dangerous yes she would tell him enough to annoy him and shake him out of his aggravating complacency also she wanted some one in whom to confide but how to bring up the subject again without pandering to her husband's desire to be master 
he gave her the chance immediately like a bulldog jim never let go of anything he had once gripped into his thick head had crept some idea of a mystery connected with south end and with his wife's visit thereto therefore he stared out of the window until he thought she was more amenable to reason and then came back to his seat with the old question why did you go to south end he asked doggedly leah not yet ready fenced i told you why i went no you didn't aksakoff says of course he does did you ever know a diplomatist who told the truth ha that comes well from you considering i never knew that white lies were political privileges besides aksakoff is too ashamed of katinka to tell the truth what's she been doing asked the duke alertly he had the soul of a knitter in the sun for gossip rescuing demetrius answered leah curtly what jim turned white and purple and red and green like a rainbow and spluttered at the mouth his wife eyeing him coldly did not think this exhibition of genuine fear a pretty sight he'll why he'll tell gasped jim gulping down an extremely serviceable word which better fitted his feelings than surroundings of course it's a question of money i suppose no it isn't but you told me what i chose to tell you i always do was there ever such a trying woman jim gulped down another out-of-place oath and strode noisily up and down the room he halted at intervals to tell his wife precisely what he thought of her as the room was isolated and there was no danger of eavesdropping servants he indulged in a raised voice and a flow of language which revealed his very limited vocabulary leah with her chin on her knuckles and a round elbow on the sofa cushion listened unmoved and looked as though she were having her photograph taken jim might have been executing his dance before a graven image for all the emotion she showed i've had enough of this shouted his grace maddened by a disdainful silence just you explain or i'll why hang it i'll forget that i am a gentleman it seems to me that you have forgotten oh you would drive a saint mad lionel is perfectly sane and he is the sole saint i have met ain't you afraid of my striking you demanded jim's bulldog nature horribly afraid can't you see how i tremble poor jim he was quite at the end of his resources mrs penworthy always quailed when he was in his tantrums lady sandal fought fairly and squarely slang for slang but this calm smiling she fiend only sat like a dummy waiting for him to do what she very well knew he would never dare to do i wonder if you're a woman groaned the duke returning beaten and baffled and completely exhausted to his chair i wonder too seeing what you have made me put up with come now i've always treated you well and other women better what other women growled jim on his guard you know very well i don't i know nothing not even why you're bullyragging me i swear cried jim pathetically to the ceiling that it's uncommonly hard for a cheery chap like me to be tied to a woman who 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 here words failed him and he gasped go on i admire your descriptions of my personality they are so extraordinarily vivid and true who ain't what she ought to be leah's opportunity to break the ice had come and locking her hands together she gazed pensively at the duke who wriggled uneasily on his seat how did you guess jim guess what demanded the tormented man that i am not what i ought to be the duke stared aghast then you ain't he shouted dr demetrius might say so leah he sprang up with clenched fists and his face took on a direfully black expression which rejoiced her heart jim i believe really i believe that you have some love for me after all oh hang your fine talk demetrius i have kissed him he dared to kiss you i dared to kiss him you devil he suddenly raised his fist leah never winced although he towered over her with his mouth working and his eyes animal in their unconsidering passion it was impossible to strike although his heart cried out that she ought to die 
with an oath he came out savagely this time the fist dropped i'll have a divorce muttered jim and plunged for the door because i kissed a man nonsense kissin don't stop at kissin not with you perhaps leah he turned and reclosed the door which his rage had wrenched open i know you've got a beastly tongue and all that but i could have sworn that you were as pure as my mother well and so you can what after you confessin that you kissed demetrius ugh leah shuddered as a picture after the style of wirtz rose to her mind's eye i kissed a thing which was once demetrius is he dead then better if he were ugh that kiss was the most horrible thing i ever had to do in my life why did you do it then i was forced to she said faintly and nausea made her place a handkerchief suddenly to her lips the duke returned for the third time to his seat and looked into her changing face with round inquiring eyes there's something in this i don't catch on to he muttered then with gruff tenderness and a timid caress from which leah did not shrink what is it old girl the duchess laughed it was amusing to find her husband playing the spring bachelor i believe you love me said she recovering her colour you know i do only you keep me at arm's length have i not cause you wouldn't have if you behaved as a fellow's wife should said the duke bluntly drop skirtin round the bush and plunge in leah admired and respected him in this peremptory mood and for once showed no disposition to use her sharp tongue instinct told her that she had at length reached the end of jim's tether and that her easy-going bulldog was inclined to curl his lips therefore did she relate picturesquely and half truthfully all her doings since the beginning of things in the gallery for the time being her story broke off with the return of his grace jim listened with praiseworthy self-control he certainly growled and scowled at the relations of that early loss which had bound demetrius to the service of the woman who betrayed him but her artless confession robbed the butterfly caress of half its iniquity sometimes he grunted admiration of her pluck during the perils of his absence and grinned when she detailed the melodramatic interview with strange most of the time his eyes searched her face to make certain that she was telling the truth he believed she was although she kept back the precise way in which demetrius had departed for siberia but she laid enough of this particular blame on aksakoff's back to make jim swear the mean dirty foreign hound cursed jim between his teeth i don't pretend to be an angel but if i drop to that he shook his fist with a scarlet face and to think aksakoff should dare to make use of your room the rotten cur i'll tell him what i think better not jim let sleeping dogs lie sleepin mongrels muttered the duke all right but don't you ever speak to him again do you hear he blared out the order in a regimental manner and leah nodded yes dear she said meekly we must draw the line somewhere jim nodded and gloomed and rumbled up something about aksakoff that certainly was not a benediction then he harked back to his leading question which had not yet been answered why did you go to south end katinka who had rescued demetrius from sakhalin island made me go to see him i had to obey else there might have been trouble the man was ill on board strange's steamer strange thought we paid the cab we did leah frowned at the recollection of the sum but he had some liking for demetrius and helped him to escape worse luck come now don't say that siberia jim shuddered beastly place siberia nonsense the climate is quite decent if you make up your mind i don't believe those convict creatures suffer so much as they say she told the lie without sign of emotion but all the same felt an inward qualm at the memory of the doctor's terrible narrative the duke chewed his moustache meditatively and you saw demetrius ugh leah covered her face and rocked to live with that in my thoughts and to think that i kissed it 
why did you demanded jim furiously to get the cipher letters connected with the insurance plot she replied looking up then detailed with necessary suppressions the greater and least repulsive part of her nauseous visit to the tramp steamer the story sounded by no means pretty and all her courage was necessary to enable her to arrive at finis when she did the duke sprang up in a pelting rage my wife to be treated like that oh the treatment was not so bad lied the duchess easily of course my mouth was sore with the fall in the stairs but i managed to touch the lips of that that uh, oh i'll go to south end to-morrow announced the duke frowning i can't thrash demetrius poor devil but i'll hammer the life out of that second-hand skipper you won't find the boat there jim i made inquiries and learnt that it left as demetrius said it would shortly after my visit and we are quite safe that kiss leave the kissin alone cried jim turning on her fiercely of course i see you couldn't quite help it but no but at all contradicted leah sharply if i hadn't bought back those cipher letters in that way the whole story might have come out and then jim well you know i do i do jim groaned and dropped on the sofa beside her oh what fools we were to go into that insurance business it was my fault dear don't worry demetrius will die soon and strange has his blackmail we are entirely safe katinka oh said the duchess with a flippancy she was far from feeling i suppose she'll sit by the grave of that man for the rest of her days you're sure he's dying yes she turned pale and her voice quavered such an object could not possibly live it would be a um, um, sin what's his trouble i don't know i can't say i don't want to say it's it's too beastly for words ah he looked looked oh leah's mouth worked like a rebuked child and she burst into tears into real womanly tears of shame and terror and outraged modesty that horrible kiss oh that horrible kiss she wailed pinching his shoulder in her hysterical emotion poor old girl said jim softly and put his arm round her for once she appreciated marital sympathy and learned that woman was not made to live alone leaning her cheek thankfully against the rough tweed of his coat she sobbed vehemently a frightened and crushed creature jim felt that he was a married man after all and administered gruff consolation it worried him to see this high-spirited woman break down so utterly there there said he tenderly it's all right old girl you've got me thank god murmured the beaten atheist jim thought she must be going out of her mind what's that that she should thank a god she did not believe in and for a husband whom hitherto she had always scorned quite frightened him what's that leah he asked again thank god for you sobbed the duchess brokenly oh my aunt muttered the startled husband then proceeded to fresh consolation well then i'll break the head of any bounder who dares to say a word against you yes but i'm afraid we're wicked jim other people are as bad said the duke stoutly though i don't suppose we'd get a sunday school prize course it ain't much good racin and blinkers we're a bad lot the pair of us i've behaved like a rotter and worse while you're like something i can't think of seems to me leah we've been runnin awfully crooked let's make a fresh start from scratch and go straight for the future tandem you know suggested jim i'll be wheeler as usual we must make the best of things i suppose whimpered leah drying her eyes and still too much unstrung to realize her regeneration that's about it we'll give sin a rest for a bit i'll chuck that woman and be your husband i swear leah i'll be a methodist parson sort of husband no don't said the duchess alarmed it's a mistake to overdo things jim laughed and she laughed 
well i don't suppose i could keep on that game for long said her husband but i mean that i'll be awfully square and foodle after you round the town it's the sort of thing good husbands do you know give us a kiss old girl and we'll begin our married life all over again leah obeyed very contentedly and nestled in jim's strong arms like an innocent schoolgirl she felt worn out and tired and drowsy from excess of emotion felt also that here was a much desired haven for a worried woman dear old jim she sighed and jim kissed her again the light was dying out of the sunset sky and the room filled with pale warm shadows the reconciled pair sat silently on the sofa in the gathering darkness locked in a close embrace the remorseful jim felt that they were prisoners in the same dock and anxiously paved a certain place with the very best intentions leah went to sleep thanks to a less tender conscience to the world these two were the prosperous and happy duke and duchess of pentland to themselves a misguided couple driven to do wrong by circumstances but to god what did they appear in god's sight remorse is not repentance and remorse was the sole feeling of which they were capable leah's sleep was the slumber of the worn out jim's self-promised reformation the result of shame shallow beings miserable creatures they could not plumb the depth of their wrong-doing to them sins were faults and they were governed less by the sermon on the mount than by the laws of society indeed it is questionable if either one of them was aware that such a sermon had been preached but both knew to a hair how far they could go without being ostracized jim was the better of the two for the cold brutal story told by his wife made him hot with the public school shame of having done things which no fellow could do the drastic codes of eton and harrow and rugby and winchester came to his mind and he saw how he had sinned against the primitive laws of honour without oaths he swore to lead a better and cleaner life with leah to help him he would be charitable and a good landlord and take the chair at public dinners and speak in the lords and chuck lady sandal who was too expensive and drop gambling to a certain extent and not swear more than necessary and and do what a man in his high position ought to do it will thus be seen that poor jim's ideas of reformation were crude he felt this himself poor man in his narrow brain and like the child he really was looked down to ask his clever wife's advice he had no time to consider the irony of the thing even if it had occurred to him for discovering that leah was sound asleep he wondered hugely from the placid expression of her face it was very plain that her crimes had not followed her into dreamland jim whistled softly marvelling that she could slumber so immediately after what she had told him laying her gently back on the sofa he summoned her maid and went about his own business this was to begin reformation without loss of time i must help leah to be good said the new groom but first he had to reform himself and set about the first step or what he conceived to be the first step with the enthusiasm of the very bad person made uncomfortable by remorse the vicar of firmingham received a visit from his patron just as he was about to enjoy a well-earned dinner lionel said the duke nervously i'm coming to communion in a month could you get me whitewashed in that time lionel stared and looked upward strange to say the heavens did not fall End of chapter thirty three